We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Mars Hanna. I am our uh, head of sustainability and climate on the government affairs team at Google and I have the honor of uh, moderating this discussion today. Um, thank you so much for joining our session on uh, cutting carbon in the digital world, myth and facts. Very pleased to be joined by an esteemed panel uh, of experts who are going to help guide us through this, this discussion today. Uh, before we introduce them, I do want to flip to our other sponsors, um, just to say a few words of introduction. So I'll pass it over to uh, Stephen Moore from GSMA and then uh, to Maya from ICC. So Stephen, over to you. Thank you very much, Mars. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, my name is Stephen Moore, and I'm responsible for the Climate Action Program at the GSMA. The, if you don't know, the GSMA is the uh, Global Industry Association for all mobile network operators and other companies in the mobile ecosystem. So very much looking forward to uh, having this discussion with you today. Thank you. And, and Tamea, over to you uh, on the ground uh, on the ground there. Thank you, Mars, uh, and welcome, everyone. Uh, quite a thinning crowd here in Katowice uh, towards the end of the end of the week of the IGF, but um, uh, us with the International Chamber of Commerce, very glad to be here um, to represent global business. Um, my name is Timea Schutte, as Mars said. Um, I am the lead for digital in ICC's global policy department. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, the International Chamber of Commerce is the World Business Organization. Um, we represent around 45 million companies in over 100 uh, countries worldwide. Um, and we act as a de facto focal point for business input into internet governance discussions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tamea. Well, well, let's get started and I'll introduce our panel. Uh, we're very excited uh, to have uh, George Camilla here, who leads the International Energy Agency's analysis on energy and climate impacts of digitalization uh, and works on a range of topics, including critical min minerals and energy security. Uh, we're also joined by Pernilla Bergmark, who is a principal researcher at Ericsson, focused on sustainability impacts of ICT. Uh, she's a co-author of the Exponential Roadmap for 1.5 Degree C Aligned Action, uh, and is also active in the ITU standardization on climate impact assessments. Uh, Stephen Moore, who, uh, who spoke a moment ago, leads the Climate Action Program at GSMA, uh, which, as he said, is the Mobile Industry Association. And his role is to provide leadership to support and accelerate the industry transition to net zero uh, by 2050. And we're also joined by Savannah Goodman, uh, who is an energy technical program manager um, at Google, where she leads efforts to identify uh, and develop data and software solutions needed to achieve Google's 24-7 carbon-free energy goals. So with that, let's kick it off. We've asked each of our panelists to spend a couple minutes um, uh, sharing their thoughts on on uh, some of the issues around the carbon footprint of the ICT sector, uh, strategies that companies are taking to uh, mitigate their emissions, and then opportunities for the tech sector to play a role in driving decarbonization. So uh, why don't we start with George? Um, over to you, George. Thank you. Thanks, Mars. Uh, and it's a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, so yeah, I'll try to provide a, a bit of a scene setter. So here in, in this chart, you can see um, you know, the pace of change of, of digital technologies is, is much faster than other economic indicators like population, GDP, or, or electricity use. So the number of internet users has grown by about 10 times over the past two decades. Global internet traffic is up about 2,000 times. Um, so, you know, logically it follows that uh, there's a perception that energy and emissions have also grown quickly. So there's, a, there's this headline um, in the next slide from Forbes uh, from 1999 predicting that the internet would use half of the US electricity supply by uh, 2010. Um, and in reality, it did increase, uh, but it topped out at closer to 4%. So a, a far cry from the, uh, the 50% that was projected. So globally, the picture is quite similar. Uh, here we can see internet traffic growing very rapidly, 17 times over the past decade. 
Uh, demand for data center services growing by almost 10 times, but data center energy use re uh, remaining relatively flat and accounts for about 1% of global electricity use today. Uh, data networks account for just over 1% as well. And we continue to see uh, similar headlines. Uh, if you could go back to the, yeah, the Guardian headlines. So we're continuing to see these similar headlines, these very sensational headlines about, you know, how the energy consumption of the internet will, will explode over the next few years. So, but in reality, we actually don't know. Um, it's, it's unlikely to grow that quickly, but there is also a lack of data to estimate uh, both the current energy use and emissions. Uh, these are all estimated and even more uncertainty when we try to predict future trends. So, you know, if we think about emerging technologies like blockchain, AI, 5G, and how they might grow, and then how much energy they might use into the future, that's a very difficult task. So given the, the, this uncertainty, what we can do is implement strong climate policies to make sure that these technologies are as efficient as possible, while also investing in rd and to develop even more efficient technologies in the future. Uh, so in this chart, you can see that uh, global emissions today come from many different sectors and services from power, industry, transport, buildings, agriculture, land use. Um, and that we actually need to decarbonize all of these sectors to get to net zero by mid-century. Um, and with a limited carbon budget that is available, uh, the de digital sector must decarbonize faster than virtually every other sector. And since we face challenges of decarbonizing uh, se sectors like heavy industry and long distance transportation. Uh, and the final slide that I have is uh, looking at uh, global energy related CO2 emission trajectories. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, a promise and, and uh, positive signals coming from countries. So if we think about uh, pre Paris, uh, we were headed for, uh, you know, a significant increase in emissions. But uh, since Paris, there have been uh, a lot of policies implemented, more and more countries committing net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, but we're still uh, quite a bit away from net zero emissions by mid-century. So here, digital technologies can not, on, uh, not only play a role in reaching net zero as a sector, uh, but perhaps more importantly, applying these digital technologies to enable emission reductions across other sectors so we can get to net zero globally as quickly as possible. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you so much, George. Uh, Pernilla, let, let's turn to you. Um, over to you. Yes, and I think I will, will uh, basically continue where uh, George ended. So if you take me to the next slide. Um, so as George said, there are a lot of uncertainties when it comes to, to forecasting, especially, but also to look at the current status of, of the ICT sector footprint. And this is the reason why it's so important to collect real world data, because these com systems are really complex to to uh, model. So that is why we in our research have collected data from operators, from manufacturers and so on from, from uh, related to data centers to get real operational data for life cycle carbon footprint. And then we have seen much in line with what, what George showed us that we have a footprint which is quite sta stable nowadays at around 1.4% of overall global emissions. That includes data centers, devices and networks. And uh, the blue curve is the data uh, curve, as you also showed. Uh, but what we don't stay at 2020 here, but what we uh, show it between 2020 and 25 and moving forward is that as a sector, we need to reduce our emissions. Uh, so that is why, and please take me to the next slide. Uh, we have worked jointly between the ITU, the human body for, for, for uh, uh, ICT sector, GSMA, GSE, and the Science-Based Target Initiative. We worked uh, uh, jointly to develop trajectories which are uh, aligned with the 1.5C development, uh, which is roughly corresponding to a 45% reduction between 2020 and 2030. And we and the, the trajectories that you see here, they, they are sub trajectories for different subsectors. Uh, so ambition level differs a bit between them. Uh, and they are something which is a normative scenario, but this is also something which is a possible scenario uh, based on the uh, background work that we did. Uh, very much related to, to switching to renewable energy, but also to, uh, to have uh, uh, more energy uh, efficient products also moving forward uh, next. 
Uh, and uh, to, to complement this, uh, ITU uh, just recently uh, published a new recommendation on standard, uh, which is about how to work towards net zero for the ICT organizations. And then the uh, halving scenario that we saw in the previous picture, that is uh, the, like the first step. That is what we need to do the first decade. Uh, next. So if the uh, previous two standards showed us what, what we must do, what emission uh, ambition level we must have, uh, this work by the UNFCCC, the Climate Action Pathways, uh, that is a work that has been led by the climate champions. Uh, and it includes uh, uh, different thematic areas, including energy, human settlements, industry, land use, uh, ocean, coastal zones, transport and water. And within the industry tech, uh, they have looked at both the heavy industry uh, and light industry where ICT and mobile is a part. And there is a uh, 2050 vision and summary and there is also an action table. And this action table uh, gives concrete guidance for the sector, for policymakers, uh, for the financial sector on how to, to work together to decarbonize uh, this sector. So th this is worth reading and it gives you the at different time scales what needs to be done. Uh, and the, the last one. So, and just to remind you, complementing these more uh, um, principal uh, uh, suggestions on what to do, uh, there, it's of course also very important to work jointly to address supply chains, to to uh, find ways to, to work with SMEs and so on. And we are working in this case in the frame of the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, where we are developing such work jointly. So that is also uh, an important uh, part of, of uh, managing to, to reduce emissions of the sector. So thank you, I'll finalize that. Thank you so much, Pranilla, that's terrific. Um, Steven, let, let's turn to you to tell us a little bit about how the mobile sector uh, is tackling this challenge. Over to you. Thanks very much, Mars. Um, so yeah, you've heard from, from George and Pranilla there on um, the kind of the scale of the problem and the challenges and the kind of policy and recommendations to uh, actually meet them. So what we've been doing uh, in the mobile industry is also first to align our ambition with um, what's needed. So uh, in terms of the Paris Agreement uh, that agreed to be, it's all right, you can go to the next slide, <laughs> agreed to be net zero um, by 2050 to limit global heating to 1.5 degrees. And that's something that we actually got um, agreement on from the whole sector through the, the board of the GSMA, which has the, the largest mobile network operators sitting on it. We got agreement from them to uh, commit to be net zero on behalf of the whole industry, uh, the whole mobile industry by 2050. And that was actually back in February 2019. Um, and then as Penilla mentioned there, we were um, involved in helping to understand what the pathway would be down to net zero and those carbon reduction targets, particularly over the next 10 years, which are really, really crucial. Um, what we've also been doing with our members is helping them to better understand what their climate impacts are. So you can see some stats there on the left-hand side. So 69% of mobile network operators by connections and 80% and of the industry by revenue actually now disclose their climate impacts on an annual basis to the international reporting platform CDP. So that just creates a huge amount of transparency around what the carbon emissions are um, from the operators and across the sector, uh, what they're doing to reduce them, uh, including uh, their targets, and, and it will show how successful we're being kind of year on year um, to report back on progress. On the right-hand side, you can see a couple of stats around you know, where we want to get to. And the first one is on science-based targets. So these science-based targets are aligned to the sector pathway that Penilla mentioned before, the ICT sector pathway. So that is looking to basically halve emissions um, by around 2030. And that halving in emissions is, is not just for the, you know, the own operations of mobile network operators, but actually looks at their whole value chain. So we're looking to reduce emissions across the whole value chain, which basically encompasses the whole sector. 
we've got about two thirds of the industry by revenue committed to that, uh, about half by connections. And then quite a few uh, of the industry have actually gone further to that. About a third have committed to be net zero by 2050 or, or even before. Actually, quite a lot of mobile network operators are now committing to before. So we've got a sizable group committing to do it by 20, uh, 2040. I think we even have one or two of actually aiming to do it before then. So, I mean, this is really to show the kind of scope and scale of the ambition and how uh, many of the uh, companies across the sector are really, you know, stepping up and saying that um, we're going to be cutting emissions really rapidly over the next 10 years. Terrific. Thank you so much, Stephen. It's exciting to see um, the, the level of commitment uh, at a sector wide level to decarbonization. Um, Savannah, let's turn to you uh, to tell us a little bit about uh, how Google in particular is tackling this challenge for its operations. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Mars. Um, if you can go to the next the next one. So I, I, today I wanted to talk about our, our 24 seven carbon free energy program. But before we get into a little bit what of what that means, I um, want to go through very briefly what Google's energy journey has been, because indeed it has been a journey. And, you know, we um, recognize that there's really, you know, can be an on ramp for lots of different organizations um, and at different you know, levels of, of, of contribution, right, to, to really neutralizing their, their carbon footprint. So that's where we started um, with carbon neutrality in 2007, uh, which means, you know, essentially we purchased enough offsets to um, and renewable energy to net out our operational emissions uh, to zero. And then in, in a decade later, in 2017, uh, we were able to match all of our global annual electricity use with renewable energy purchases. Um, and this was, you know, we're really excited, a big achievement. Um, however, we, you know, wanted to really go the next to the next step and truly eliminate our emissions from electricity. And that's where we get to 24 seven. And so at a high level, that basically means that we will eliminate our um, electricity emissions in every single grid we operate on um, every single hour of the year. Um, and so, you know, this is really kind of the, the natural extension of 100% renewable energy by matching the um, electricity we consume on an hourly basis to, to carbon free energy sources. Uh, next slide, please. So just to get a, a little bit of a visual representation, right, of, of moving from 100% renewable energy to 24 seven carbon free. Um, this graph is an example data center um, uh, based in Iowa. And you can see that the green, which is the carbon free energy supply, if you sum all of that up, um, it, it's actually um, at, uh, greater than actually the, the sum of the, the black, which is the, the consumption. Um, and what that means is that even though we, on an annual basis, procure enough uh, to equal to the total consumption for our data center there, there's still times, you know, during the day, during the year, where we're relying on um, electricity from the grid, which isn't fully carbon free yet. And so this is, you know, kind of the, the crux of the problem that we're trying to solve. And the ultimate goal is that, um, you know, by the by 2030 for every data center, this graph would be fully green. You wouldn't be able to see any, any black. And a little bit more on what we mean by carbon free, because that's a, a key kind of principle of the 24-7 the carbon free program is moving from just renewable energy to be more technology inclusive. So that includes, you know, wind, solar, geothermal, um, biomass in certain cases, nuclear that's on the grid, um, hydropower, pump storage, and battery storage discharge. Um, and just to give a little bit more detail into what we, how we kind of calculate carbon-free energy, one of the key things to keep in mind is that we consider the carbon-free energy on the grid as well as the, the energy that we purchase through power purchase agreements. And the reason for that is that the ultimate goal of 24 seven is to, to really decarbonize the grid. And so we wanna make sure that there's alignment between our procurement and the, the carbon free electricity that's already on the grid. Um, so you can see uh, this example is also a data center, um, our Iowa data center. And you can see how um, on the top graph, that's sort of the carbon free, uh, the generation mix of the electricity grid in Iowa. And then the bottom graph is once we've actually added in the hourly production profile of our of our um, renewable 
our PPAs there, you can see the increase um, from of, of CFE score from 32% to 93%, for example. And so it kind of really shows how we get, you know, we're getting closer to that fully 24-7 uh, uh, matching with, within one data center. And again, we want to do this with every single region that we, we operate in. Terrific. Thank you so much. Savannah, and thank you to all our, our panelists here for uh, very helpful introductory uh, discussions. We got some, some very um, uh, helpful context on the industry from both George and Pernilla, and then uh, dove in a little bit on what companies are doing to tackle this issue and decarbonize their own operations uh, from George and uh, uh, Sorry, from Stephen uh, and Savannah. Um, so I have a let's turn to Q and A. I have a number of questions for for each of the panelists, and then I want to make sure we do uh, leave time for questions from the audience. Uh, so George, why don't we why don't we go back to you? Um, you showed some of the headlines that I think we've seen uh, in the media that uh, project eye popping statistics about what might happen. Uh, and, and very interestingly that this has been a, a recurring theme for, for years. We've seen similar headlines that we're seeing today back uh, decades ago. Uh, can, you, can you help us put this in perspective again and, and just uh, help us understand what, what is myth, what is fact, um, uh, and help us understand sort of the, 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 uh, the footprint of the sector uh, as a whole? Yeah, thanks, Mars. Um, so like like Pernilla pointed out, and, and I pointed out earlier, there's there's a lack of data and a lack of established methodology. So you might see, you know, numbers like 1.5% of global GHG all the way up to even 6% of global GHG. And all these have different uh, scopes, they're they're covering different types of emissions, uh, they're, uh, they're using different sources of data, they're using different methodologies, um, some of them are projecting, you know, 10 years, 15 years into the future. So it, it's, uh, there's no kind of uh, standard uh, other than, well, there is an ITU standard, uh, which is uh, about 1.4% as, as Pernilla mentioned. So some of these uh, headlines come from these uh, more sensational projections. Uh, but in reality, you know, we've often these projections are, are overestimating what is likely to happen in the future because they're typically underestimating um, uh, the, the efficiency gains that are, are possible. So that's that's one source of error. I think the comparison with aviation emissions is a bit um, unusual for me because um, it, it's a very different sector. The the users are very different. Um, you know, there's a paper recently uh, showing that one percent of the global population accounts for half of aviation emissions. So the equality of emissions and users is, is very different. I think uh, when we compare the internet versus uh, aviation and the, the pathway to decarbonize is also very different. So when we think about decarbonizing aviation, we have we don't yet have all the technologies we need and the the the, the sustainable fuels we need to decarbonize that. Uh, in ICT, we 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 certainly you know it's a heavily electrified uh, sector. Uh, Google and, and others are, are making strides to to decarbonize the electricity supply. And of course, digital can play a role in reducing aviation emissions. So you know, for example, if if all of us panelists flew to Katowice. Uh, we'd probably, you know, be emitting four or five tons of, uh, of carbon emissions. So, um, you know, we have to think about ways uh, to, to decarbonize not just the digital sector, but, but also um, other sectors as well. Thank you very much. And I'm glad you brought up this point of uh, opportunities uh, for decarbonization. I want to continue on that theme. And, and Pernilla, perhaps we could, we could turn to you. Um, and if you could share any thoughts you have on, on opportunities you see for the sector as a whole to drive decarbonization, not only uh, you know, reduce its own footprint, but to help other sectors decarbonize. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, uh, yes, and I think when it comes to that, I think we have barely scratched the surface so far. Uh, I think what, there are a lot of things we could do both within the sector and, and the, uh, as society. I think we, we should work much more closely with our other sectors to, to understand their uh, challenges when it comes to decarbonization. Uh, I think that we should look at the aggregated effects of, of complementary technologies. And what I mean by that is really that, you know, for many years, ICT sector has said, ICT is bringing this uh, enabling effect. And then nowadays you see that AI is bringing this enabling effect or IoT is bringing this uh, or that effect. And in reality, we have a lot of uh, 
collaborative technologies, let's say, that need to work together and, and, and bring a, a good output. Then I think uh, if we look, uh, at the, the sector should also prioritize solutions that are addressing the climate crisis. Uh, that should be a top priority as I, I see it. Uh, then I think that if you look at governments, I think they need to integrate much more closely their digitalization plans and their climate plans because often they are not really connected. Uh, I think it's important also to, to build knowledge, uh, methodologies and uh, data sets. Uh, and the, what we can see in uh, our research, there have, have been many estimates on, on, on this opportunity, but we can see that um, methodologies that has been used are quite crude. Uh, so this is why we're working now in the frame of ITU to develop uh, uh, methodologies uh, which are, are uh, giving more credibility in any type of, of assessments. And I think it's re really important for us to provide a good and well evaluated cases that show real potentials and also where we get the opportunity to learn from practical experiences. But because what we see is that when you look at data sets around these uh, enabling effects, uh, or risks related to those. Uh, we see uh, maybe academia presenting uh, very transparent uh, estimates, uh, but based on simulations. And we see industry presenting uh, other estimates, uh, but uh, from real world, but not always so transparently described. So, so I think that is something that would help us forward also to, to realize where there is a potential and, and uh, to, uh, yeah, um, magnify that as much as possible and also suppress uh, negative effects. Fantastic, thank you. It's interesting to draw some parallels here between some of George's comments around the needs for uh, better data standardization uh, on the emissions estimate side. And then Pernilla, your, uh, your comments here on the need for clearer methodologies for, for quantifying enabling effects. Um, seems to be certainly a clear need for, for lots more work and standardization across the industry on both the footprint and the handprint side. Um, so let's stick with the handprint uh, side of this and, and turn to Stephen um, and would love if you could tell us a little bit about what opportunities you're seeing uh, for, the, for the mobile sector in particular to help act as an enabler uh, to reduce emissions. So over to you, Stephen. Yeah, thanks very much, Mars. Um, so we did a piece of research actually a, a couple of years ago, um, which we called the enablement effect, which looked to understand uh, at that time, what uh, was the level of carbon reduction that was being enabled by mobile technologies uh, across all sectors. And uh, it was quite interesting to see that um, there are actually some quite significant savings being enabled. So I think the mobile sector as a, as a sort of subsector of the ICT sector uh, is about 0.4% of global emissions. But the emissions savings that it was enabling was about 10 times as big, so about 4%. Uh, and that was back, you know, probably two, three years ago. And we've seen... Um, mobile connected technologies rolled out much more since then. So we thought for COP26, it would be useful if we actually looked to have a better understanding of what the uh, contribution that mobile technologies could make towards the decarbonisation of four key sectors where we think that they could play a significant role. And the sectors are the building sector, uh, the energy sector, the transportation sector and the manufacturing one. And what we found is that, again, digital technologies could make quite a significant contribution. So we sort of took, as Panilla mentioned, the exponential roadmap uh, says that we have to basically halve emissions over the next 10 years. So we took that as the starting point for what needed to happen in each of those sectors. Then we looked to understand what contribution mobile technologies can make. And we found that they could actually help enable about 40% of the reductions needed. So I just do the mass view, 40% times 50%, there's about a 20% total contribution there across those four sectors. And the types of things that we looked at, um, I mean, none of this is new. So this is, this is stuff that exists, but just could be rolled out much more. So, uh, you know, um, charging meters that are enabled by mobile technologies to more smartly charge electric vehicles is a, 
as you can imagine, a really big contrib contributor. I think it's there's only about 0.8% of vehicles on the road that are electric at the moment. Um, working from home, being able to work remotely, um, which we've seen massively accelerated, uh, that was actually a really surprising uh, really big contributor as well. Uh, plus improving things like um, uh, route and fleet management uh, in the transportation sector. Um, in the other sectors, we saw big opportunities as well around smart manufacturing. Only 1% of factories at the moment use smart connected technology. So there's a huge opportunity there to make them more efficient. Obviously each factory uses lots of different processes. And then I think the final big one to mention was around the energy sector. So we actually see uh, big opportunities for creating much smarter, better connected grids. So talking to a little of what Savannah mentioned there as well, uh, being better able to match up supply and demand, uh, you know, the storage of renewable energy and then, you know, distribution when it's needed. So we see uh, there has been massive opportunities using existing technology, but which just could be rolled out much more widely than it is currently over the next 10 years. Terrific, thank you so much. It's exciting to hear uh, how many different sectors there, there's really an opportunity to make a, a robust uh, uh, dent in emissions reductions. Um, Savannah, let's turn to you. you. You spoke a little bit earlier about the 24 seven strategy that Google has taken. Uh, I, I'd love it if you could unpack this a little bit more for us. I know we, you know, it's a, a complex nomenclature of carbon-free and 100% renewable and 24/7, and it's easy to get uh, confused about what each of these mean. Um, so, so could you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how 24/7 compares to some of these other strategies? Um, you know, particularly things like, you know, what does this mean for cost or difficulty or impact on the grid? Uh, across these different uh, strategies for emissions mitigation? Yeah, yeah, sure thing. So I think, what, you know, some of the key things, uh, differences, right, between 100% RE and 24-7 and CFE are the, the time matching and then the location matching. Um, and, you know, we talked about that a little bit, but I think, you know, one thing that, um, you know, being able to make sure that you're procuring energy within your local grid that can actually be delivered right to wherever you're consuming electricity is really important. Um, but there's a little bit more even to that local aspect right of getting involved in local policy and regulatory um, you know matters with the utilities and the grid operators and and you know we, we see that as a really important part um, beyond just matching right in time and location is actually really focusing you know in the local communities that you're, you're consuming electricity. Um, you know, I think being one thing with being technology inclusive, which you talked about a little bit as well, um, that there's lots of research out there to show that to get to a fully decarbonized grid, we're going to have to expand beyond some of the traditional variable renewables. And so 24-7 is really a way to bring up the investment in those technologies and to accelerate the development, similar to how 100% RE programs have done for um, solar and wind, right? Solar and wind used to be much more expensive and corporate PPA has actually helped really drive down costs and accelerate adoption. And we see 24 seven is kind of the, the um, program to be able to do that for the next set of, you know, more firm, uh, clean technologies. Um, so yeah, those are, those are some of kind of the, the key differences and in terms of, of benefits uh, to the grid and maybe challenges, right? Um, so the, you know, there, there was a study done uh, recently by Princeton University that, that um, is really great and kind of goes into a lot of detailed modeling comparing, you know, procuring 100% um, renewable energy within, within a grid still. So it is still a local grid versus 24-7. And essentially, the, there's a couple kind of key results there, which was, you know, 24-7 um, is much stronger at reducing the, the CO2 emissions of, of course, the buyer's electricity, but also actually the system level. It will lead to better, a greater system level emissions, not just, you know, a con the consumer's own carbon footprint, which is, is really exciting and kind of the, the whole point about 24-7. Um, I also mentioned, you know, driving the earlier deployment of advanced carbon free energies. That's a huge benefit of 24-7 that you don't really get with just 100% RE. Um, and kind of a, a, a parallel to that is because you're investing in more new firm technology on the grid, there's also accelerated uh, retirement of fossil fuel capacity. Um, you know, it, a lot of if, if 24-7 really helps us move to a paradigm 
um, on the grid where we don't actually have to rely on carbon intensive firm generation. And that's that's really important so that we don't lock ourselves in into a carbon you know, emitting scheme. And that's going to what's really allow us to get to you know, net zero on the um, on the electricity front. Um, but, you know, you know, 24 seven can be a bit of a, a premium in compared to 100 percent RE. But that's part of the reason Google is working you know, on this and working to develop a broader ecosystem so that we can drive down some of the, the costs and take advantage of learning rates, uh, just like we've done with the, the traditional renewables. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and it's, it's helpful to understand uh, how these really compare, because uh, I know this, uh, it can be it can be difficult if you just hear the tagline. So it's, it's great to hear. Um, let's now turn to questions from uh, the audience. Uh, we have one in the chat, uh, which I'd like to start with. And Savannah, this is to you uh, about our 24 seven carbon free energy program. Uh, I've seen that you're providing uh, an example of this at a data center. Do you plan, do you extend or plan to extend this program to other facilities uh, of Google or really only focus specifically on data centers? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So yes, our, our carbon free energy goal does extend to our, our core campuses. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of campuses across the globe and we're working, um, the data center team is working very closely with our real estate team to make sure that we're aligned and we can, you know, more efficiently uh, procure carbon free electricity, uh, even together, right? There's some efficiencies of being able to do both. Um, but yeah, while, while, you know, data centers do consume, you know, a, a larger fraction of, of Alphabet or Google's energy, we do see, you know, decarbonizing our, our full electricity supply is really an important part. So, so uh, the short answer is yes, uh, facilities are included there. Great, thank you. So why don't we turn to uh, any live questions we have from uh, the audience on the ground. Tamea, could I, could I pass it to you to uh, perhaps see if there's anyone who has a question there? Thank you, Mars. Um, looking at the room that has filled up while, while you all were presenting, would anybody like to ask a question? Mike, please, the microphone is just behind you. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, my name is Michael Ogia. I work for the Sustainable Digital Infrastructure Alliance. And from our point of view, we completely agree with George. Hi, George. Hi, Pernilla. Good to see you. Um, from our point of view, of course, I completely agree with what George said, which was that we need data in order to actually know how to benchmark the industry going forward. And so I really appreciate hearing these interventions and the, the perspective that you're giving. But actually, I also have a question, especially particularly for Savannah, but it could also be relevant to Stephen as well, given that, you know, you work with a lot of mobile operators, but especially when we're talking about PPAs, they're great in many respects, but unfortunately, because there's no actual cable going, let's say from a wind park or a solar production, uh, you know, so to a solar farm to, let's say a data center, we don't really actually know if the power that's being purchased is actually green or not, or that it's actually then going to supply, let's say, a data center. So for instance, would Google or would mobile operators, telecom networks, would they actually be willing to you know, make that data transparent? That way we would actually know then what's you know, kind of open that black box up a little bit while also contributing to alleviating a bit of the problem that George has you know, very rightfully highlighted. Yeah, sure. I can, I can take that. So, you know, power purchase agreements are, are one form of, of transaction that we're looking at. Um, it's, it's traditionally been kind of the, the default, but just to clarify, we are looking at other kinds of, you know, working with utilities to develop full tariffs so that, um, you know, what the electricity we're getting, the clean electricity we're procuring is actually deliverable within the sites. I think a lot of this comes down to how you define the regions too. And, and you know, electron deliverability is, you know, impossible essentially to be able to, um, flow through right exactly where electrons are going through the grid. But what the 24 seven program does is really help define and narrow down, right? What we consider to be a reasonable boundary where we think electricity will be uh, deliverable. And so, for example, we've started with like balancing authorities, um, but there's a lot of discussions on whether we should be, you know, that we should go down to the market zone, right? Within a broader balancing authority. And those are things that we're evaluating and we'll continue to evaluate and evolve, right? Our methodology as we learn more and get more data. 
Um, and you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a big initiative called Energy Tag that's working on granular right. certificates or what we call time-based energy attri attribute certificates, which is really helping to bring more transparency to the claims that we're making on the electricity, you know, where it's being produced um, within, you know, what bidding zone is it being produced? What bidding zone is it being canceled against? When exactly was it produced? Um, so that's one, that's a big initiative that we're working to definitely increase kind of the transparency and bring more trust and validity, right, to, to 24 seven and, and hourly procurement. Um, and there's a lot of other areas too, where we're starting to work on advocacy efforts and data standardization efforts to bring more transparency to the grid in general. Um, so for example, we have a, a partner called Electricity Map who produces um, um, uh, hourly grid mix data. And we're working with them to be able to surface more of that data, make it available for the public um, and you know have better global coverage because that's another issue too is the data disparity is very different depending on the region. And so we're trying to really, you know, take a global approach there. If, if I may, to me, just, just as a follow-up to that, I would say that's, thank you for that. And of course, I have to really admit that Google has been quite trailblazing when it comes to um, what's going on, in, especially in your data centers. And so I definitely say that less as a challenge, and more as an invitation to continue to do that, because if we have someone like Google, or rather something like Google, that's saying, yes, we're going to open this up, we're going to make this available, it will set a standard that I think would continue to push the envelope when it comes to that kind of um, transparency that's really desperately, critically needed in order to make sure that we can achieve these goals that we've set out, especially in the short amount of time that we have. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the question. We, we completely agree. Terrific, thank you. Um, I do wanna open it up to any other panelists that might wanna comment on, on this as well, if anyone's interested. Yeah, I, I, I would like to add something. So I think it, what, what you're doing at Google with this more dynamic uh, um, way of, of looking at this is, is super interesting and super relevant, of course. Uh, I just wanted to Michael's point that to say that uh, I, I'm just coming from an ITUSD5 meeting, and this week we have uh, agreed to have a new work item where we will uh, outline how to set up a, a global database on uh, emissions of the ICT sector. And uh, actually, I want to oppose George a bit because there is actually a quite detailed standard on how you do these calculations. But now we want to prepare this uh, description of a database that we hope that the ITU as a human body will start to build up this kind of, of, of data set. Uh, so, so I think that would also add to transparency, but maybe less on the dynamic side and more on, on, on the more static side. But I think that is also data set which is uh, really needed. And we know there are a lot of um, transparent reporting from, from, from companies, but uh, it, it's not so well collected, let's say, and, and uh, hard to get hold of, or it's very time consuming to get hold of everything. Maybe Mars, just to add to Penilla's point there, um, I started off uh, my introduction by talking about climate disclosure amongst kind of uh, across the industry um, through the CDP and, and there is a, a, a huge amount of information there. Um, a lot of it is public and actually does uh, look to go into some of the intricacies of uh, what energy has been bought, uh, the type of renewable energy, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's a REC, a renewable energy certificate, whether it's a PPA, whether it's, uh, whether it's on site. So I think that's also another potential source of transparency. It's something that as a, an organization, uh, we will be, be producing an update to our kind of state of the industry and climate action uh, in the first half of next year. And we will be looking to kind of aggregate some of that data and provide some, some bit more transparency around what's happening across the whole of the sector. So hopefully that will be uh, of some interest to, um, to some of the, the viewers. Sorry, if I could add just a little bit to that. Um, yeah, I mean, all these initiatives are, are, are excellent and I, uh, you know, it, it's great to see continued progress uh, on the operational side. Um, of course, as we decarbonize the, the operations, um, so data center energy consumption, 
uh, more attention is going to go towards the supply chain of that hardware that's coming in, um, of devices that we own um, and dispose of. Um, so, you know, there, there's, I think the methodologies that we establish here uh, in the operations can be helpful in understanding and decarbonizing the supply chain as well, which will be, a, a, I think, the next challenge ahead. I wonder if, if uh, I could call an audible here and actually uh, pull uh, to talk a little bit more about that. Would love to dig in uh, to some of the discussions around value chain. I know, Pranilla, uh, you have been involved uh, through Exponential Roadmap uh, and others in some of the supply chain work. Uh, be very curious to <clears throat> if you could tell us a little bit about um, how you see that the the importance of the supply chain work and value chain work uh, evolving, and and what are the what are the strategies to, to tackle in that sector? Is it, it's quite different than, uh, than some of the others? Yeah, so, so, so I think what we can see is that definitely that the, the, there is a growing interest in, in the supply chain and or, uh, overall value chain really, and uh, uh, rightfully so. I think uh, both in the net zero and uh, neutrality discussions on how you define this, what you shall include and so on, it's very clear that this is a overall value chain perspective for companies and that we can see that uh, maybe consequently then uh, in our customers request, which is growing and growing when it comes to their embodied emissions. Uh, as Ericsson, we have reported scope one, two and three for many years, uh, even before it can become so common. Uh, and we see from our LCA studies that the absolute majority of our emissions actually occur in when for products in operation. So we sell base stations, that's our main product, and, and they, can, they are on 24-7 like a data center. Uh, so we have had for, for quite some time SPGs, both for our own operation, and we have reduced by 70% since 2016, uh, and for products in operation. Uh, so that is very important because that's how we can help, help our customers to have a higher energy performance. But more recently, we have started to focus also on the supply chain. And uh, that, that is less substantial than the upstream, uh, downstream for us, but it's uh, much bigger than our own emissions, although we are present in the majority of, of the countries of the world. Uh, but we see there is a balance, of course, uh, as uh, George mentioned. So I think it's m important to point out again, when, mm -hmm. when uh, uh, customers, operators go more renewable, of course, the, uh, the relative importance of, of, of embodied emissions uh, increase. Uh, so, uh, and, and we also know that supply chain is very much related to the use of electricity for suppliers. So, so uh, we think it's very important to work with uh, other companies with, with and within uh, our, within or outside, I should say, uh, of, of our sector, and also to work with policymakers, as I think Savannah mentioned, uh, because it uh, has very much to do with uh, uh, access to, to renewable electricity. And that's why we work with, within the frame of the 1.5C supply chain leaders, where we are with companies like, like BT and, and so on, but also with, with uh, Unilever and, and other companies in, in completely different sectors and the work to develop what we call the 1.5C supplier engagement, a guideline which helps us to, to tackle the diff based on practical experience to, practic uh, to tackle the, the uh, different challenges in relation to how you address your supply chain. Great, thank you very much. Let's go. Let's go back to uh, the the group live on the on the ground there. And and to me, can I pass it back to you if there's other other live questions? Sure. Anyone uh, willing to take the floor? I know Mike has a second question. If not, please go ahead. Hi again, everyone. Sorry, Michael Ogia. Um, sorry, I have a lot to say because I've been working very passionately on this topic since 2016. It's something I, I really care about. And George, to be very frank, I used to be one of those people that was like, oh no, you know, the data growth, how are we going to deal with the energy use and whatnot? And I have since um, become a lot more conservative about that in part because of the IEA's work. And to me, I really want to kind of uh, support something that Pranilla was talking about, especially, and I'm really uh, appreciate that Marsden, that you took the conversation that way. 
I don't think that energy use, as much as it's important and decarbonizing the sector is important, I think that material use is much a, is a much bigger problem going forward than actually thinking about, um, about the energy itself. Especially, I guess this is a good question for George, because of all the work that you've done with critical minerals. And how do you see the future of the ICT sector in terms of the amount of minerals that we're using, the amount of production that's happening, with the amount of servers that we're creating? How can we then also change the narrative a bit to make sure that we're addressing ICT sustainability from a little bit more holistic way as opposed to just focusing on the energy use? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, no, really, really great point. And, um, you know, I try to highlight you know, the progress on the, the energy efficiency side, renewables procurement, but also the, the challenge that lies ahead around if, you know, if we assess at the life cycle level, uh, especially with look, looking at minerals. So, uh, yeah, at the IA, we, we published a report looking at critical minerals in broader clean energy transitions. And um, actually, so currently EV batteries, for example, you know, account for half, about half of um, kind of battery mineral requirements with, you know, ICT, obviously, in consumer electronics, a big share. But in the future, if we are to see the, the huge growth that we need in, in electric vehicles um, across cars, uh, trucks, buses, uh, the energy sector actually will be a dominant player in material use. Um, so certainly any lessons that are learned in the ICT sector around recycling, reuse, uh, around these critical minerals um, will be very important uh, as we need those clean energy technologies that will rely on, on metals uh, and minerals that uh, we either need to mine from the ground or uh, need to recycle in a, in a sustainable manner. Terrific, thank, thank you, George. Um, I, I have one more question. I wanna go back uh, to the, the some of the themes around uh, energy efficiency uh, that I know, George, you brought up on particularly on the data center side um, and, and Stephen, I wanted to ask you on the uh, on the mobile operator side, if you could help us understand uh, some of the trends around efficiency, thinking really specifically around this very unique time in history uh, with uh, uh, this nearly two year period of, of COVID-19 when uh, all of a sudden you know, hundreds of millions of people began suddenly working from home uh, and, the, and the use of the ICT sector exploded. Um, can you help us understand how that impacted energy and emissions uh, and what, if any, sort of energy efficiency uh, models or, or, or trends you saw uh, over the last couple of years? Yeah, sure. Um, we did actually reach out. So it was earlier uh, last year. So just uh, towards the end of kind of the first lockdown that we had. So we reached out to uh, some of the operators in the task force, particularly those actually across Europe, um, because there were fairly similar lockdowns happening at fairly similar stages across Europe. Um, to ask the European operators uh, what they were seeing, were they seeing a sudden spike in energy consumption, had it affected their carbon emissions? And because quite a lot of the European network operators, they, they have a lot of our members have mobile networks, they also have, also have fixed line networks as well. And they've just seen perhaps a, a bit of a shift. So obviously there was less uh, commuting use of mobile networks and there was more, some more fixed line uh, at home. But then there was also maybe some more mobile network use at home where for those who didn't have fixed line uh, and would have normally used their fixed line connection uh, in their office. So it was a bit more of a shifting geographical pattern. Um, they, there was, you know, certainly a bit more of a, an increase in data traffic because we were all stuck at home and basically watching Netflix. Um, so there was a lot more of that going on. Um, but what they found was because these peaks and troughs are built in to the way that networks are designed and, you know, you, you can't have a data center fall over because everyone suddenly wants to stream the latest movie on Netflix. So they found that actually there was pretty negligent change, negligible change in, in energy use over that period. I think, if anything, it was maybe less than 1%. Uh, as I say, because um, the actual structure is designed so that it, the energy use is, is actually fairly constant, regardless of what the data traffic is going across it. Now, that's not to say that that's how it's going to be necessarily going forward. And we know that 
for example, uh, 5G technology is much more dynamic. Uh, and we're going to be able to use uh, artificial intelligence, for example, to be able to monitor when there are likely to be peaks and troughs in data traffic, and then actually even uh, ramp up or, or shut down uh, part of masks uh, correspondingly. So maybe like 3 a.m. in the morning, not very many people on their phone, you can actually maybe close down uh, maybe two thirds, three quarters of a mask because it doesn't uh, need to be acting at such a, a high level. So we definitely see those kind of dynamic efficiencies that can happen uh, going forward. Um, and this is one of the reasons why actually, although we're gonna to have to, coming back to the point that was raised about embodied emissions of equipment, that is something we're, we're having to consider as we roll out 5G masks and it's really important. At the same time, 5G is, is much more efficient at moving data around. It uses much less energy to move a byte of data around. So. Again, these are the things that the science-based targets that a lot of these companies have signed up to, they're having to evaluate all of this because they've got to look at the operational energy emissions, but also the emissions that are coming from the stuff that they buy up into their supply chain. Terrific, thank you, thank you so much. Let's do one final question and then I wanna ask each panelist to just give us one moment of uh, closing thoughts. But before we do that, um, Savannah, I just wanna come back to you on the 24 seven strategy. Um, and just ask if you could tell us what you see as the biggest challenges uh, to adopting a 24 seven uh, strategy and, and um, what companies can do to help uh, remove barriers to, to uh, taking up one of these uh, goals. Yeah, sure. So I think we, we've talked a lot about data you know, data transparency and, and lack of data. So that, that's one area. And I think, you know, we've talked about that a lot, but, you know, some of the other challenges are, you know, 24 seven is complex, right? You're going to need, once you have all that data, it's a lot more data and you're, you know, now needing to really understand on an hourly basis, what your profile looks. And, you know, I think going, thinking beyond, right, the traditional PPA for organizations is, is definitely something that will need to be done. Um, luckily, you know, we've started to work with partners like AES and Angie to develop these products that are, um, you know, flat, like 20%, uh, for example, 90% carbon-free energy supply. And then, you know, AES will go out and procure the portfolio. So we kind of have this energy manager approach, right? And um, that can help simplify, right, for buyers by having this sort of intermediary who can deal with some of those complexities. And so, you know, um, one of the, the things that we want to do is, is continue to develop products like that. Um, another example is we've worked with a company called Fervo, Fervo to do a, a geothermal pilot. Um, and again, that's advancing that new technology development. And so part of it is really just like getting involved in 24-7 and growing the ecosystem. Um, so SE for All, for example, has organized um, a 24-7 compact. Uh, there's a website, Go Carbon Free 24-7, if you're interested in learning more and, and participating. And I think that's like a really great way to start getting involved. Um, there's a lot of different folks who've already signed, um, signed on to the COPE compact from buyers, suppliers, regulators, you know, utilities, uh, cities, right? So it's, it's really about bringing the ecosystem together so that we can work on developing new products, new market systems, you know, bringing more tra data transparency, all of these things we've talked about and really servicing them. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I would, I would say. Terrific. Thank you so much, Savannah. So this has been a, a very exciting session and thank you so much to our panelists. It's been uh, very helpful to, to hear some of these themes around, particularly around the need for improved data uh, transparency uh, and better estimation methodologies on both the footprint and the handprint side. Um, lots of opportunities that we all see uh, that we just talked about today to decarbonize both electricity supply through strategies like 24-7 and then the need to get uh, to, to work as well on supply chains and uh, and value chain, and then many opportunities to decarbonize across uh, decarbonize other industries by deploying uh, mobile technology uh, by by deploying uh, ICT technology. So, very interesting discussion. I want to ask uh, if we could just close by having each panelist maybe just give us thirty seconds uh, on what you are most optimistic about uh, heading into twenty twenty two for the role of the tech sector, the ICT sector in in tackling climate. Uh, so let's go, let's go, George, uh, Pernilla, Stephen, uh, Savannah. So George, over to you. 
Thanks, Mars. Um, I would say it's the, the the people in tech that are, I think, increasingly interested and engaged in, in climate change and sustainability. That's uh, quite promising. Data scientists, AI practitioners are they're thinking of, or they're learning more about the energy system, transport systems and how they can apply their skills uh, to reduce emissions in, in, in all these other sectors. And I, I, I really uh, it's really, um, I guess, yeah, I, I feel a lot of hope around that because they have all these skills um and we we need those skills in uh, decarbonizing all these other sectors so yeah great pernilla okay so I, I think i go a bit in the same direction so i'm optimistic about the increasing awareness and also that there is really a positive competition when it comes to the race to zero among top runners um but uh, I, I think there is an obvious risk also, if I may, may include that, that uh, we get a bit of a young, young boys football. Everyone is very enthusiastic, but maybe not so organized. And there is also a risk for green wishing and green washing. Uh, so, so uh, and then of course we need to find ways to scale beyond the usual suspects that we see in this type of, of events. So, so, so yeah, we need to broaden, but, but, but the direction is definitely positive. Terrific, Stephen. Yeah, I, I'd um, kind of echo the points that Penelo and George have made, and, and say that from from what we're seeing across the the kind of telco sector, uh, is incredible appetite for collaboration on these issues. Um, you know, we have more than fifty companies now part of the task force, climate action task force, and. We've, the, the projects that we're working on continue to expand. So we've got projects looking at energy efficiency. We're gonna start a renewables project. We've got something looking at the circular economy of network equipment. Another one looking at circular economy of devices. Um, we continue to champion uh, climate disclosure and uh, setting science-based targets. And I do, I'm sure there'll be other things that we'll be working together on uh, next year. So it's just, uh, I'm always very grateful for the fact that effectively competitors coming together and winning to talk about these issues and, and work together to solve them. Yeah. Terrific. Savannah. Yeah, and maybe just to expand on that, um, I, I think that's what's really exciting to me is seeing all these different, you know, who might be competitors within their own industry come together. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of folks in the data center org really taking 24-7 goals seriously. And um, on that note, uh, the U.S. federal government just announced a 24-7 carbon-free electricity goal uh, yesterday. And so, you know, it's just showing the influence, right, that the ICT sector can have on the broader globe, the broader organizations. Um, so I think there's a lot of momentum there. And um, yeah, that gives me a lot of, of optimism looking, looking forward. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, well, please, everyone, join me in, in thanking all of our panelists uh, for, this, for this exciting discussion. Uh, and uh, good luck to everyone uh, on the ground in, in Katowice with the, the rest of the, of the uh, conference. And thank you all so much.